Hi and welcome to another episode of Open Dialogue. We've traveled a long journey. We started 8 months back and since then we've covered 10 very different topics. Uh, ranging from what is money to how do banks and central banks function. We've received overwhelming response from all of you and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts uh, for that. We thought this would be a good opportunity for us to recap the most interesting and the most insightful bits of the journey that we've captured thus far. Financial markets are complex. Finance and economics impacts each one of us on a daily basis. There is a lot of interest today in these topics. However, these topics are complex. Open dialogue is an effort from Access Bank to bring to you these complex topics in a fairly simplified manner so that you can understand how the world around us works. Open dialogue covers broadly two types of topics. We have the conceptual wherein we take some topic, let's say what money is or how interest rate works or interest rates work or how forex works, etc. and try to explain the fundamentals around it or the contemporary wherein we take some topics of uh, interest in the current environment, let's say what's happening to the global economy or what's happening to the Indian economy and bring some insights around that. We started talking about the global economy and what's happening to the world around us. And the topic of that uh, conversation was, is, is a recession around the corner? Uh, well, this topic was covered about eight months back and eight months down the line, while a recession hasn't occurred yet, but a lot of the things that we spoke about are now coming to bear. So I think the big uh, areas we spoke about then was how the US, uh, which has done very well, uh, but on the back of record deficits. Uh, so it's a deficit uh, funded kind of spending that is keeping the economy up and how that could result in challenges around inflation and probable recession uh, in the second half of this year. The Fed's own, the US Fed's own belief is that uh, in order to bring inflation down to acceptable levels, they need to trigger a recession. So they have been raising interest rates quite dramatically. Uh, so have other uh, developed market central banks. And whenever this happens in the past, uh, we've seen a recession, so which is why the moment the, the rate started going up, everyone started expecting a recession. If you look at US markets, I think uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, there has been a very large rally in the past few months. If you look at the S&P 500, it's up 10% uh, just in the last three months. From October lows, it's uh, probably up about 30%. Uh, NASDAQ is up about 25% uh, in the last three months. What happened during the, uh, uh, during the COVID pandemic, uh, as uh, uh, both fiscal and monetary uh, easing had happened to protect the economy from damage, uh, the Fed's balance sheet ballooned. Yep. Now, when inflation went out of control, uh, they promised that they would do quantitative tightening. Correct. That they had perhaps printed too much money. Right. And they are now going to bring down by $85 billion a month. So that process is now about one year uh, into it. Uh, we are one, one year into that process. And uh, uh, and that process, as it continues, you will see that the quantum of dollars uh, available, and remember that the dollar-based cost of funding is what uh, uh, it, it affects not just the US, yep. but uh, a lot of other company, countries as well. Uh, or we spoke about uh, the structural issues that impact China and how that uh, story is seeing a structural slowdown. If you measure the Chinese economy on these fronts, the labor input is going to be negative because their demographic decline is actually quite accelerated. It's much faster than had been expected even five years back. Right. And so the number of births is collapsing. Uh, the number of people who are working age shrinking very rapidly. Uh, total factor productivity was actually negative even before the pandemic. So, so TFP, or total productivity in China, 2014 to 19, was falling at 1.5% a year. Right, and yeah. your, basic, your contention is that that was happening because power, the kind of the production was moving from private hands to state hands, and state hands it are... It was a major driver. Of Understood. And the second is that uh, in, 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 so, so the growth was completely coming from capital injection, right? Right. So, 
real estate construction, yep. infrastructure construction, uh, mm -hmm. a, a lot of automation, robotization, you know, so lots of, and, and uh, complete domination. Now you're seeing the same thing happen in the battery ecosystem, what earlier happened in wind and solar. So now what is happening is that, and remember that nearly a third of China's goods exports are by multinationals operating in China. Right. And they're not by Chinese companies. Right. And and of course, 20 years back, it was 60-70%. Now, if you look the, for the next five years, so the demographic decline, decline continues. The stance of the government is not changing. So basically, the TFP growth will be at best the same or zero or negative. And capital formation needs to slow down because real estate investments are slowing down. Yep. The local government financing vehicles are no longer active. Uh, I mean, they cannot leverage themselves more. And so they are going through a severe growth concern. Or we also covered uh, how all of Europe seems to be also in a structural fix. And by the way, even at that point in time, starting to go into recession. Right. So, uh, in, so as you can see, that uh, their fertility rate is too low. Working age population is shrinking. And they are now finally battling the the third E in what is called the impossible trinity of demographics. So uh, so there is uh, uh, ego, economy, and ethnicity. Right? So so you can't have all three. For a long time, the, the Europeans were uh, compromising on the ethnicity side. So there was a lot of immigration happening, legal and illegal. And uh, now there are, you can see right-wing movements which are against it. There's a lot of protest. So I think Europe uh, on the demographic side has significant issues. And so we are seeing now all of this uh, uh, play out and many of these come to as we discuss in our topics. Uh, one of the conceptual topics we covered was uh, money. Uh, money is, you know, it is a fascinating topic because it is so central to every day what we do. Uh, but also it is at the same time an extremely abstract con concept. So for one thing to be so common, so commonplace, so everyday, but also to be extremely abstra abstract is very fascinating for me. Uh, and I think on the topics of money, the things that stuck me the most were first how money is like, uh, you know, it's money exists because we believe it exists. It's like religion or God, uh, as Nilkan put it. Uh, and the power of money is that all of us believe that that money is worth something, something. Money is like religion and which means that uh, you can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't feel it. But you know it exists because you believe and everybody believes that it exists. Correct. Money is, a, is an abstract concept. Uh, you see, in human life, uh, everything other than our physical body needs is a myth. Right, so so many people say religion is a myth. Uh, you know, race, ra uh, religion, caste, everything is a myth, and we we have needed that to be able to function together. Yep. So this has a value of hundred rupees because all of us believe that it has a value of hundred rupees. You, you, you would you would remember, you know, uh, the Hindi phrase that "footi kodi ke barabar nahi hai," because footi kodi was a unit of account, right? right. It, was, it was a form of money. Right. And it was actually a footy cody, right? <laughs> uh, so the invention of paper money was just a replacement. Earlier people would exchange beads. Uh, there is this fascinating story in, in a book by Milton Friedman called Money Mischief, where uh, there is this island uh, in the Pacific Ocean where uh, there were giant rocks with holes in the middle, which were considered money. Right. And the, the fascinating thing is that the richest family there had a massive uh, sort of block of rock, which was actually in the middle of the ocean. So they had, they had tried to carry it from the neighboring island and the ship sank. And for generations, people said that that is the wealthiest family, though their wealth was actually at the bottom of the ocean. Right. So money is, is a myth. Yep. It, is, it is something that uh, is necessary for all of us to function, yep. for the economy to function. Uh, but at the abstract level, uh, it it is, and we, we've been through demonetization, right? I mean, suddenly, the piece of paper that you held was actually not very valuable, right? Uh, and uh, uh, but it is it is absolutely essential uh, for the economy to function. The second thing that struck me the most uh, as part of money was how money gets created, 
सो सेंट्रल बैंक्स क्रिएट मनी बट ऑल्सो कमर्शियल बैंक्स क्रिएट मनी एंड जस्ट दिस नोशन ऑफ हाउ वेरियस एंटिटीज क्रिएट मनी एंड हाउ दैट कैंड ऑफ फ्लोस अराउंड इन दी इको सिस्टम इज अनदर फैसिनेटिंग टॉपिक वी कवर दिस नोशन ऑफ एम जीरो एम वन एम टू एट्सेट्रा सो एम जीरो इज बेस्ड मनी राइट इट इज करेंसी इन सर्कुलेशन प्लस बैंक्स डिपॉजिट्स विद द सेंट्रल बैंक राइट सो समाइम्स द बैंक्स वेन दे when they you know so like our bank uh, if say uh, uh, we we got 100 rupees of extra deposits today and the extra money we lent out is only 60 we have 40 rupees left at the end of the day and we can lend it to someone else in the overnight market or we can just give it back to the rbi that keep it parked so that i need it tomorrow over that if you if you add uh, uh, demand deposits uh, uh, then you get to a different definition which is called m1 and demand deposits is savings accounts and current accounts correct if you add some more friction you get to m2 which is where you add time deposits these are uh, fixed deposits fixed fds fixed deposits and fds and all that because you cannot liquidate it that easily will, yeah right that easily uh if you add to that money market funds then you get to m3 right uh, because there are money market funds also with a one two day lag you can you can get access to that money which are uh, like this overnight funds etc that you know people can Like corporates, a lot of corporates park money into the uh, exactly. money market. Right. Yes. Uh, and then there are other high, higher, higher measures called M4. For example, if you are holding someone's loan, now if you want to add all of that, then becomes M4. But uh, from a from a monetary management perspective, most countries stop at M2 and M3. Right. Uh, because those those are the liquid forms of money, which in some ways the the central bank can control. Uh, and the final one is uh, how central banks think about. using or think about the creation of money and the impact it has on things like inflation etc and again a very interesting anecdote we covered here was the uh, 100 trillion dollar uh, you know note from zimbabwe which actually is worth uh, you know less than 1 dollar uh, in 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 us dollar terms uh, so so that was a very fascinating topic uh, this is a print out obviously uh, this is a 100 trillion dollar note uh this is from zimbabwe uh the way i discovered it is that uh, my son had a uh school project and he had to talk about currencies and i was doing some google search and i found this and i found it very interesting and then kind of he went and spoke i'm sure it is worth more uh, that that piece of paper is worth more than what it is because <laughs> it is because i just found out that uh, the worth of this when it, before it was decommissioned was about 40 cents mm-hmm. uh so so what is the story here like how does a piece of currency get to 100 100 trillion dollars and still is valued only at 40 cents because see uh, as we discussed right at the beginning of our conversation uh, the value of that piece of paper is is what everyone agrees the value of that piece of paper is so if the sovereign starts to overdo it meaning they start printing a lot more um, than is necessary then the value of the currency starts to drop right and uh, the sign of that is inflation that if uh, the fact that the same 100 rupee note if you say we are at 5% inflation is one year later it can buy 5% less uh, than it does today so inflation is uh, a, a devaluation devaluation of the currency uh, over a uh, over a sustained period and uh, so so what the what the zimbabwean government did and there have been other very famous instances like china in the 1940s uh, germany the, after world war 2 yeah weimar republic uh, 1920s um, where we have had issues of hyperinflation in yeah. fact uh, someone would say argentina had gone through it yeah. recently venezuela is going through it so uh, so, so what, but when when that starts to happen people start finding alternatives and this is the funny thing about money that uh, if you don't if the, the government does not give you money then they will find alternatives uh, yeah. like in germany after the second world war cigarettes were a form yes. of currency <laughs> yeah uh, right so people used to sort of exchange cigarettes uh, yeah. when they had to do it the other very fasc- fascinating anecdote that i kind of uh, remember is this 100 rupee note which basically says that i promise to pay the bearer the sum of 100 rupees uh, and essentially the note itself is saying that that note itself is not worth 100 rupees i mean the note is it's not 100 rupees it is worth 100 rupees going back to the topic of uh, belief around money and i'm going to read what's what's written here right so it says yeah. uh, i promise to pay the bearer the sum of 100 rupees and it's signed by the governor so i have one observation and two questions mm-hmm. 
So observation number one is that obviously kind of this itself is not a 100 rupees, right? It, it's it, a piece of paper. It's a piece of paper. It, it feels like a security. With, yep. it, it says that I will give you 100. So my two questions are the following. The first one is that if say somebody did thought experiment, somebody went to the RBI and gave them this 100 rupee note and said, look, you promised to pay me 100 rupees. So please give me 100 rupees. So what will he get? So this is uh, happening as we say, as we speak, right? So people are taking the 2000 rupee notes and giving it back to their banks right. and they're getting credit in their bank accounts. We covered uh, the Indian economy and uh, uh, you know, one of the uh, great things about today's uh, uh, environment is that India is perhaps one of the very few uh, sweet spots in the global economy. And after a very long time, uh, many forces have come together which make India very well poised for the next 10-15 years in terms of growth. Uh, and those include things like how uh, obviously our demographics and how we have a very strong uh, and young population which is just coming into the working age. Uh, it includes the state of our balance sheet. So uh, both the uh, uh, consumer balance sheet where debt levels are significantly below uh, many of our peers uh, or the banking balance sheet where after a very long period of stressed loans and bad loans and the like uh, India is now at a place where the banking system looks pristine and looks very very healthy uh, which means that it can support prolonged periods of growth from here. The balance sheet is a snapshot so, uh, so GDP is like income so there's a flow. So there's a flow measure, uh, a balance sheet for a company. Uh, you know, the reason it's called balanced is that there are assets on one side, liabilities on the other. When you talk about a balance sheet of a country, uh, I think it's important to understand that there is no balancing element, right? There is, uh, uh, but it's more of a snapshot. And India also has about 1.27 trillion dollars of international liabilities. Basically, Indian companies having foreign loans. So this doesn't need to match. At a global level, uh, the assets and liabilities obviously have to match. But for a country, when you're looking at the balance sheet in the form of uh, international investment position, it, they don't need to match. Uh, if you're collecting 100 rupees of taxes, but your, your government is spending 120, 130, 150 rupees, uh, you are effectively borrowing from the future. Uh, so so you're, you're imposing this burden on future taxpayers. And uh, so sovereign debt to GDP, which is if you aggregate the central government debt, the state government debt, the municipal government debt, and you look at it as a percentage of what your annual income is, which is GDP, this ratio is, uh, is the sovereign debt to GDP. And uh, this is also a measure of how healthy uh, the government's uh, or the country's uh, position is in the sense that if it is low, you have not borrowed from the future. If it is very high, then you have uh, been borrowing from the future and then you need to slow down. Corporate balance sheets in India got over levered, right? And then we saw, we saw the downturn, uh, you know, post that for various reasons. I mean, some political, some regulatory and so on and so forth. And as a result of that, um, banks saw significant amount of NPS built on, on their portfolios, which is when we came across what was uh, at that point in time called a twin balance sheet problem in India. And at the same time, uh, corporates were unable to, you know, grow because they had over levered themselves and, you know, in a sense burnt out because of the problems uh, that we saw in the country at that point in time. Today, the situation is, is exactly the opposite. Sure. Right? Bank balance sheets are, are in pristine shape. Uh, they're well capitalized, well provided for, margins are good, growth is good, uh, and the credit cycle is relatively benign. And which means that the banking sector in India is well positioned to be able to support growth for this country. On the other hand, you are seeing corporate balance sheets are probably in the best that they have been in a decade. A debt to EBITDA uh, is like 1.5, 1.6 times which is a very low number. Debt equity is less than 1 which is again a very, very healthy number. Which means that corporates as and when corp promoters in India begin to see that, uh, that the future is good. Um, and that demand is good, they will start to invest and grow. And, and the headroom for growth, because of the relative, relatively low leverage 
that is there at this point in time certainly exists. So, you you've got this virtue cycle now that banks are in a great shape, they want to lend and corporates in are, are in a great shape and hopefully they will start to grow and therefore, banks being confident to be able to lend to these balance sheets, uh, hopefully we will get into that virtue cycle of growth as we go forward. Or when it comes to the corporate balance sheet, which again are extremely deleveraged and you know have significant scope for uh, increasing growth through investments, productive investments in assets. Uh, and so, a variety of things coming together uh, to support India uh, as India embarks towards the next phase of growth in the coming decade. One of uh, our audience favorite topics uh, was the topic on uh, options and what's happening to, to uh, particularly in India around options trading. Uh, it's again a very fascinating story. Uh, one, one could go to the extent of saying it's perhaps one of the scarier or high risk stories in the uh, context of the India's uh, growth potential. Uh, and what's happen, happened in the country is uh, options trading uh, has gone through the roof. And uh, uh, as Ashish mentioned in the episode, uh, the volume of options trading is now 400 times that of the uh, cash market. The derivative volume today, most of it, 99% of it is uh, the volume in the options market today, is 400 times the volume in the cash market. Wow, right? 400 times. 400 times, right? Um, and uh, if it is 400 times the cash market, then clearly it's not an instrument that is being used to hedge that risk, yep. right? It's something that is being used uh, as a risk. It's being used for the to purpose of uh, yeah. speculation, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's being used to take risk rather than hedge risk, right? right? Uh, even more scary, 40% of options being traded are by uh, retail uh, investors or retail traders. And on average, 9 out of 10 of them actually lose money. And when they lose money, they lose on average 50,000 rupees. Uh, and on top of the, that, they pay another 28% in terms of transaction costs and the like. And so, we have this huge horde of uh, young uh, uh, Indians who have uh, put their money or tried options trading. Most of them have lost money, but this continues. And uh, uh, it is something that, you know, uh, brings about an element of risk. Uh, when it comes to uh, hard-earned money of our young uh, Indian, uh, you know, uh, citizens who are who are maybe just getting into their first job. Nine out of ten, 10 individual traders in equity futures and options segment incurred net losses. On an average, loss makers registered net trading loss close to close to fifty thousand rupees. Over and above the net trading losses, loss makers expended an additional twenty-eight percent of trading losses as transaction costs. And the last point is those making net trading profits incurred between 15 to 50 percent of such profits as transaction cost. So, uh, so firstly, obviously, it is quite telling. Uh, secondly, the fact that SEBI has had to instruct people to put this uh, on the login pages itself is quite telling. First of all, uh, let me start with the fact that uh, uh, I am sure most of your listeners uh, know what is options. But what are uh, really derivatives, right? So, derivatives are instruments that derive their value out of certain other instrument, right? Yep. So, in this case, is, uh, uh, it's a stock price, right? And so, derivatives generally are in two kinds. There is a futures and there is an option, right? And uh, the, uh, what we are talking about is really the option market, uh, which gives the buyer right to either uh, call for the share at a certain price or sell the share at a certain price, right? And the seller has the opposite obligation. Uh, derivatives were defined as, uh, or designed as instrument for someone to hedge his risk. Yep. So, if he is investing in a company, he has a certain risk of price movement. Uh, so, these were the instruments that were supposed to reduce, reduce that risk, risk yep. right? The other interesting aspect in this uh, conversation was the demographic profile of these people. Uh, on average, these are a decade younger than let's say mutual fund investors or equity investors. Uh, and also, uh, uh, compared to like this is the same profile that uh, you can see 
in let's say online uh, gaming uh, like fantasy sports as an example of the new lot that is coming a new customer the addition that is happening the average age is actually under 25 years wow right so well, first jobbers me yeah right uh, hopefully jobbers anecdotally we know of students who are now dabbling right. into this market uh what is also interesting is lot of this uh, uh, traders have come in in the last four years right, right? Uh, and um i think 2019 uh, uh, the total number of uh, uh, retail traders in the option market was uh, uh, up, uh, about uh, 0.5 million today that number is seven times higher that uh, 3.5 million wow i can see it so you know, um, i think you know, lot of uh, young people are getting uh, attracted into this market uh, uh, we are seeing Uh, you no know, um, um lot of uh, uh, traders come from tier 2 tier 3 towns in fact uh, in terms of new customer additions uh, with some of these uh, 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 stock broking fintechs uh, who dominate this market so they have over 60% share uh, now uh, um, uh, um, more than uh, half of their uh, new sign ons are from tier 3 or beyond cities right right if again i compare it to the mutual fund industry he he i or the cash market uh, um, uh, most of the uh, investors are actually from uh, tier 1 cities and the metros but in the option market we are actually seeing uh, um, well, more people now coming in from the hinterland as well uh, i think what has happened is this new age apps have uh, 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 both because of their ease of use because how they have dropped the transaction charges particularly at the time of entry has attracted a lot of uh, the billionaire so to speak and uh, i think they are dominating this uh, market activity uh, compared to what we see in the traditional investor base and finally uh, the contrast that ashish made between the two which is in the case of uh, online uh, you know fantasy gaming basically 15% of uh, of the pot actually goes to the or, or to goes to the house and the rest 85 is actually transferred back to to the consumers so essentially if you put in 100 rupees you can expect 85 rupees back but in the case of options actually only 15 rupees comes back and the rest 85 is it goes to kind of high frequency traders etc so it seems like a high risk uh, game which retail consumers are losing but continue to play and that's something i found really fascinating in this topic so basically by uh, 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 putting 1000 or 2000 rupee i am making a bet that is uh, the notional value of the bet is 10, 10, lakhs. 10 lakh rupees right so the op- the alternative is that you put 10 lakhs and take that risk versus yes. you put 2000 and yes. take the 10 lakh risk right so basically you are getting 500 times the leverage, leverage yes right so that is the leverage that is attracting uh, people in and i believe it's as good as gaming or betting yep. right because you uh, your return Uh, this return uh, matrix is so skewed that you put 2000 you are putting uh, uh, really uh, making a bet of 10 lakh rupees and that's uh, attracting people despite the fact that there are uh, uh, so many of them who are actually losing money so in this case if 90% of traders are losing who's the person making the money okay so one is 90% of retail traders are losing money exactly yes right? uh as we discussed earlier there are other parts spent including institution including arbitrages including the high frequency traders yep so they are also kind of uh, probably making money we don't have the stats of how much money they are making of course the intermediaries whether they are the exchanges uh, uh, whether uh, uh, they are the uh, 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 the, the the brokers they are also making money and uh, you can see their profitability has also gone up 78x uh, in the last uh, few years right, right. but uh, i think in aggregate uh, and uh, that sebi report what you quoted uh, from earlier uh, provide very stark data about how much money retail is actually losing yeah. uh, both in uh, absolute amounts or, and also as a percentage right uh, uh, as per that report 90% so 9 out of 10 traders lose money 
uh, if you uh, look at in value terms uh, of the total amount bet by the retailers 80% of the money is actually lost right uh, only 20% so if goes back to the retailer uh, goes back so if i say all the retailers is one person yeah. if they put in 100 rupees only 20 comes back and 80 is lost and that's where the analogy to this fantasy uh, yeah, sports exactly. com yes. comes in because any company you look at it they typically have a 15% uh, take rate right, right. so if uh, all people who are building their uh, cricket team uh, their pool is uh, put in uh, only about 10 to 15 is retained by the company and 85 is distributed to all the gamers Right. So the odds are exactly opposite. Yes. Here you lose 80%, then yes. you would have gotten 80%. 80, 80%. Yes. Yes. So if you want to bet, maybe online giving is a better, uh, better uh, than options yeah. trading. One of the things we try to do in uh, almost every open dialogue video is to bring some counterintuitive insights. Uh, you know, in all the conversations we have to bring some excitement. And one of my favorite counterintuitive counter -intuitive insights was the fact that over the last 30 years, returns from Indian debt markets have broadly been similar to returns from Indian equity markets. Uh, and it was a fascinating discussion with Shiva, uh, where we went through how if you take every five year period, and if you look at debt returns versus equity returns, in five out of the six five-year periods, actually debt does reasonably well or something of that. I may be missing my stats, but something of that nature. Obviously, we've made such a great success of equities. I don't think in the industry, we've really, really touched as much on the fixed income side. I hope this conversation changes some attitudes towards fixed income as well. Some of the things that I'm going to talk about, obviously, will be pertaining to past performance. And it's very important to understand that these stats and discussions that we will have pertain to past returns and may not necessarily be carried forward to the future. This is very, very important in any kind of investment decisions. That please look at the past, understand the past, but don't assume that the past is going to get repeated in the future. You made a very important point about the last 30 years, right? That returns from equities isn't spectacular. It just so happens that about 30 years ago is when NSE started. Right. right, And then we have Nifty data going back from about 1994. Right. Around that period of time is also when India started liberalizing interest rates. Right. And we started seeing a development of the GSEC market. And it so happens that ICSA Securities started an index of sovereign bonds called the ICSA Sovereign Bond Index, also going back to 1994. So now we have close to 30 years, but close to 29 years of data which shows the relative performance or just the performance of these asset classes in India over really long periods of time. What I find really interesting is the cumulative returns over the last now 29 years from Nifty and the ISEC Sovereign Bond Index are basically the same. They are the same. They are the same. And also the fact that we can't do rear view driving, right? Just because the last three, four years have been great for equity markets uh, doesn't mean that the next four will also be. Uh, and in the context of that, we spoke about the importance of diversification and asset allocation. What I'm trying to say is, it's not to say that, you know, fixed income or bonds are likely to outperform equities. Far, far from it. I still believe that equities is a great asset class. But what I'm trying to say is that we should not get carried away to make it a gospel truth yep. that equities is the only way to make money. Yep. And it's very important to have a, a so-called asset allocation approach, which is to basically make sure that you have enough of different asset classes in your portfolio because these asset classes perform differently across cycles. Yeah. And thinking about how you want to create your portfolio so that over a longer period of time, you're making uh, reasonable returns uh, from whatever investing you are doing. I, I use a term called drawdown and drawdown is essentially uh, a loss of your capital or a, or a fall in the value of your portfolio. Right? Uh, why I want to make, make this mention is that if you lose 10% of your capital right, and you make back 10%, you're not back to the previous high. Absolutely. Right? Because start with 100, 10% down, you're 90. 10% up from 90, you're only at 99. You're right. not reached 100 again. Correct. Right? This is the thing about risk. That risk is not symmetric. 10% uh, drawdown is not the same as a 10% rally. When you if you have 10% fall, you need 11% gain to go back. If you have a 20% fall, 100 going to 80, you need 25% to get, go back. And God forbid, if you have in 2008, when your market fell by 50%, 
yeah. then obviously double. you know you have to double to go yeah. back to the previous high right so falls are falls and gains are not symmetric even though we use and so called the arithmetic standard deviation to express risk it is not symmetric and that is why the riskier asset class whenever you know once in 5 years 10 years when you if when you have large drawdowns maybe because of a covid situation or a global financial crisis it kind of eats away a large amount of previous outperformance right so it's and this cannot be predicted could you have predicted covid no, no way yeah. could you have predicted the gfc maybe some people did to some extent but certainly not the extent of uh, the crash of the markets so i think it's important to have this in mind that how do you manage your drawdowns in your portfolio and when i say portfolio it's not just equity portfolio or debt portfolio or total portfolio, portfolio, portfolio that we have uh, and hence this notion of thinking about debt in a very different way than it is popularly perceived and thinking about investing in debt in a very different way uh, was what i took away from this episode personally one of the topics that has fascinated me is this notion of foreign exchange how uh, how does trade happen and how does value get uh, traded between different countries which have different currencies uh, and in this episode on forex with neeraj we started with you know talking about how cowrie shells were used uh, in ancient times as the first mo- mode of of doing cross border trade and how that has evolved over time the earliest dated use of money hmm. in the history of civilization actually predates the written world predates uh, the written world written world okay so effectively we we you started as as a, as a civilization we started using money almost i think 4 to 5000 years ago right and over a period of last 4 to 5000 years different kinds of things have acted as money right. as we know it um starting from Uh, you know we all know about gold and silver right uh, but bronze iron um uh, animal hides right and the most interesting example that i can think of is basically cowrie shells right so it gives a very different perspective to you know you hear this in hindi films a lot right do kadi ka aadmi hai a very different perspective to the yeah, but kadi do <laughs> do kadi means its value right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's worth something <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely um, we also covered various aspects such as what determines uh, the foreign exchange rate uh, and you know in the context of that we spoke about capital account flows current account flows and the like so there are basically three variants uh, number one is what we call as floating floating means it's fully market determined the market determines the value of one currency against the other currency depending upon the cash flows or the you know the money flows that are happening as we discussed in the previous episode the second is what we call as a peg which is basically a fixed linkage between one currency and the second currency one example hong kong dollar is a peg to us dollar right so the exchange rate between hong kong dollar and us dollar is fixed at all points in time no matter what happens to the underlying demand and supply the third which is basically an intermediate is what we call as a float or a partial float it is in some sense is market determined floating but there is a very strong influence of the central bank in the market and the central bank decides how the currency's exchange rate moves over a period of time using very tools and various tools and techniques that they have uh also what was fascinating for me uh was this conceptual interlinkage or interplay between foreign exchange rates interest rates and inflation and how the three of them are linked uh moving kind of leading into the what 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 is more popularly known as the impossible trinity and how that challenge is faced by every central bank and every government i mean all of these economic variables are very interrelated i mean give you an example of inflation and exchange rate right if your exchange rate is if let's say your currency is weakening the cost of the imports is going up and as the cost cost of the imports are going up uh, and if you are actually using a lot of imports for domestic consumption there will be an impact on domestic on inflation, inflation yep. because of the weakening currency right and if you are a central bank who is very focused on uh, domestic inflation your inflation targeting central bank then what you what will happen is you'll be forced to raise your interest rates to tackle this inflation which in some senses can be an imported inflation right so all these variables tend to get interactive they they tend to interact with each other but 
in general i think what the central banks like to do is have a very domestic driven uh, interest rate um, sort of management strategy and exchange rate management strategy in line with what the domestic objective is to make sure that exchange rates are aligned with the economic fundamentals over a period of time uh, and so this foreign exchange topic covered such a wide array of uh, of areas and there are just so many interlinkages uh, which once kind of you understand the conceptual interlinkage it becomes quite easy to understand why markets behave in a certain way uh, or why uh, the economy behaves in a certain way uh, linked to the foreign exchange and i think that interlinkage is what made this for me one of my uh, most uh, favorite or most interesting talk conversations to have as part of open dialogue banking is a fascinating business it's a it's an extremely complex complicated business with many many moving parts <clears throat> uh so kind of a couple of things that uh, uh by the way kind of uh, i find really interesting about banking is uh, the first one is this notion that uh, you know banks are traditionally thought thought of as intermediaries you know they take deposits and give out loans but actually in reality banks create money and this notion of banks creating money and uh, uh, you know increasing the uh, kind of the supply of money in the economy uh, and hence being a very very critical part of the overall economy is something that uh, uh, interested me a lot and we covered this in in length uh, as part of our discussion uh, banks create money uh, there are two kinds of money broadly speaking in an economy there is the money which is called the primary liquidity or primary uh, sort of uh, money which the central bank creates right. which the reserve bank of india creates banks take that liquidity and multiply it yep. and convert that into uh, a kind of money which you and i can use right you think about this um, when we have to go about our ordinary day to day lives we have to buy something we have to sell something uh, we operate on the bank accounts that banks provide right we don't operate on on the money that or, or the accounts that reserve bank has because reserve bank doesn't give accounts to ordinary public it gives accounts to only banks so effectively banks take that money and by way of giving credit they multiply that money and they create the kind of money which is used by an ordinary citizen and hence banks are an extended form of what the central bank does this money commonly known as m3 because m0 is what is called what reserve bank generates m3 is what banking system creates is the primary form of credit that goes the wheel that that makes the wheels of the economy go round right and therefore in every aspect of commerce in every aspect of transactions there is an involvement of banking whatever we do uh, whatever kind of economic transactions we do we use banks to settle our payments and we use banks to receive money right so that's how essential the business of banking is to the running of a modern economy also how banks operate and you know how they take liabilities how they deploy it into assets what are the various types of risk how do they manage it uh, how do they manage regulations and so on and so forth there is a bank and it has only two customers there is a depositor and there is a borrower so just to illustrate the three risks you are talking of the first risk is that i took the deposit from the depositor i lent it to the borrower the borrower went bankrupt and now is not able to pay back the money and so now there is risk because the depositor's money can't be paid back so this is risk number 1 risk number 2 is that the depositor has created a depo- let's say put a one year fd but the borrower has taken a five year loan and at the end of one year i have to return the money back to the depositor so i need to find one more uh, somebody else somebody to, else to bring in the give money give me that the deposit and now if at that point in time the money is not available then there is a problem because then you know the bank can't uh, honor the depositor's uh, money so this that's is the liquidity that's the liquidity risk that's the liquidity risk the third one is that the deposit the one year depositor uh, you know while i may find somebody else but maybe the one year deposit was created at 7% and the loan was given at let's say 7 and a half 
at the end of one year when the deposit gets renewed, maybe the interest rate was 7.5% already, uh, which means that I am making no money on my no uh, loan. Yeah. And because of the change in interest rate, uh, I am uh, my interest rate here is fixed and this has gone up and that is creating another risk on, yeah, so on the, the bank. The mismatch between the two sides is creating a earnings risk for me. For the bank, yeah. For the bank. Uh, very, very interesting topics. We discovered, uh, we discussed this at uh, length with Neeraj. Uh, and this is, uh, this has to be one of my uh, favorite topics as part of Open Dialogue. One of, uh, I would say, one of the tougher topics we covered as part of Open Dialogue was uh, the topic around central banks. Uh, and, you know, central banks are just so central, uh, pun, pun not intended. Uh, to the economy uh, and there is just so much interest in you know uh, monetary policy announcements or regulatory announcements that are that happen by the central banks but at the same time the details of how central banks operate and what they do and how did they evolve are actually not that well known they are not that well researched uh, and so for me personally it was a great learning experience uh, having this discussion with Neeraj and understanding how central banks work uh, how they play various roles. They have a role around monetary policy, around uh, forex management, around uh, uh, banking the government and being a banker to the government and obviously around regulatory uh, and managing regulatory framework uh, for, for the financial sector. And so how banks play this role, central banks play this role and you know how various central banks around the world uh, do this slightly differently uh, was another topic that I found uh, extremely interesting. Historically, there was no such thing as a central bank. Right. They were all banks, right? And some of the banks over a period of time acquired the characteristic of a central bank. Different episodes in the history have led to different kinds of central banks, right? And in some senses, if you look at modern central bank, all of these reasons why the central banks came into play are kind of folded into a central bank today. So the first and foremost is basically uh, creator of credit, right. or creator of money, right? Uh, and we are in a fiat economy, right? We are basically in fiat money system. Uh, so central banks today effectively print notes, print currency, uh, and ensure that there is faith in that currency, right? Uh, so, and people trust that currency to be able to, you know, use it for their day-to-day -day economic transactions and as a store of value, right? Uh, and they do that and this entire uh, function of creating money and making sure that there is faith in that money, there is trust in that money is effectively a monetary function of a central bank. The topic around central banks very technical but I would say one of the uh, most important topics we covered as part of Open Dialogue. That brings us to the end of this recap episode of Open Dialogue. I hope you liked uh, the content that we put together. Uh, over the last eight months, uh, we've had great fun and great joy in bringing all of these topics to you. We hope you enjoyed watching it as well. Uh, over the last eight months, we've received over 2 million views and we have about 20,000 subscribers. We wanted to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for tuning in and for following us. Our team continues to work very hard to bring exciting new topics. So continue to watch this space for more. And before we end, Please do like, subscribe and share our channel. Thank you for watching.